Hi, it's me. Uh, we're going to do something a little different today. We're going to take a walking tour of Central Park. Uh, this walking tour is based upon Radical Walking Tours of New York City by Bruce Caton. Uh, it's a little political walking tour. We start in Columbus Circle, and what we're looking at is uh, a monument to the USS Maine, which was built in 1913 as a tribute to the 260 soldiers killed during an explosion on the ship while it was docked in Havana Harbor. The accidental explosion was treated as an act of war by William Randolph Hearst's yellow journalists. Uh, the media contributed to the beginning of the Spanish-American War. As a result, the United States took over Cuba, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. Hearst sold enough newspapers to finance the $175,000 cost of the monument. Uh, Columbus Circle is where the Women's Health Action and Mobilization held rallies in October in the early 1990s. <clears throat> to counter the Right to Life movement's creation of a people-formed cross on 5th Avenue and 34th Street. Wham also outnumbered the right wingers, disregarded police orders not to follow uh, march down 5th Avenue, and featured speakers like Church Ladies for Choice, Penny Arcade, and the late Bella Abzug. Uh, Columbus Circle was also the site of a restaurant where the Transportation Workers Union was started in 1934 in order to unite subway, bus, and trolley workers. What you're looking at now is Umpire Rock, um, <clears throat> it is a natural formation of granite that uh, overlooks the first children's playground in the park, uh, built around 1926 uh, from a donation from one of the um, people that live around the park. Uh, the book calls them the rich people that live around the park. Uh, it also noted, uh, notes that uh, when the park was built, it was a huge boondoggle and uh, <clears throat> basically helped the people that lived around here by both raising the assessed value of their property and uh, when they eventually sold uh, <clears throat> their apartments, uh, making a tidy sum of money. Um, the interesting history about the uh, playgrounds and the ball fields, which are also surround Umpire Rock, is that there was a debate uh, when they were built about whether there should be ball fields or playgrounds in the park at all, because they might attract the wrong element known as the working class uh, into the park, which was viewed as kind of a private uh, country club to the more wealthy people that lived around the area. Um, <clears throat> over here you can see... Here we are at Tavern on the Green. Tavern on the Green was originally built as a barn in the 1870s uh, and that housed sheep. And the sheep were taken across the street to Sheep Meadows, where I'm standing right now, um, <clears throat> because to feed and do whatever sheep do. Um, it's the only restaurant allowed in the park. And uh, the book is rather amusing about it because it talks about how uh, it was originally owned by the grandson of the founders of Warner Brothers Studio. And um, <clears throat> in the 1970s, after a $2.5 million restoration, it was reopened with a 7,000-pound Sunday, three bikini-clad women, and the largest bottle of champagne that was as high as then-Mayor Ed Beam, who they described as a Democratic Party hack. We're here looking at a couple of uh, playgrounds that are next to Tavern on the Green. Um, the interesting story behind them is that there are two adjacent playgrounds. Uh, in the 1950s, Robert Moses, who um, is both credited and despised for building large highways and public uh, works projects between 1920s and the 1970s, um, had decided that he should build a parking lot next to Tavern on the Green. Um, when the women who live next door to the park in the Upper West Side heard about it, they began to hold vigils and use the, uh, their husbands to fight the plan. Uh, when he tried to uh, bulldoze the lot on Arbor Day, uh, the wives ultimately stopped him, and Moses had to back down, claiming that he was actually going to build a playground for the children all along which explains why there are two playgrounds next to each other in this particular location in the park. Now we turn around and look at Sheep Meadow, which has a lot of history behind it. Uh, it was basically a dust bowl in the 1970s and was, uh, after $40,000 was spent to make it into the grassy plain that you see today, uh, Abby Hoffman helped organize a human being uh, of 10,000 people in uh, 1967. 
1967, Martin Luther King also started a mobilization against the Vietnam War, uh, which started here. In 1968, Coretta Scott King followed in her husband's footsteps after his recent assassination and led the Spring Mobilization, which attracted 100,000 people. Uh, in 1969, 3,000 people participated in a lion to symbolize the Vietnam dead. Uh, and in 1970, the first gay pride march ended up in Sheep Meadow. Here we are at uh, Strawberry Fields, the picture. Prior to this was the Dakota, where John Lennon was shot, and this area was opened in 1985 um, and commemorated by Yoko Ono uh, about his death. This is where he and Yoko would take um, long walks together. It's designated a quiet area in the park. Uh, Lenin was uh, threatened with deportation from the United States after he um, organized concerts against the Vietnam War, which was considered un-American activities by uh, some in the Republican Party. A little bit more looking at strawberry fields back up in the uh, pathways. We're looking at the Bow Bridge, which uh, crosses the lake in Central Park. Uh, it was designed by Calvert Vaugh, who wanted each structure in the park to be unique and to blend into the landscape. Now we're in the Ramble which is a 30-acre section, uh, very famous for its bird watching. It's also an area where gay men are known to frequent to have uh, sex. In 1947, Harvey Milk, uh, the first openly gay uh, city councilman in San Francisco, who was later assassinated with uh, Marsconi, um, <coughs> was arrested here for having sex. Uh, in 1978, uh, there were frequent attacks against gay men in this area, uh, the most famous being against figure skater Dick Button. <clears throat> it's also very quiet here. Some other views of the ramble. Uh, in 1950, Robert Moses wanted to have this area uh, bulldozed and turned into a senior citizen center. Uh, if you wanted to learn more about Robert Moses, um, a book by Robert Caro called The Power Broker is one of the quintessential biographies. We're up in Belvedere Castle now, uh, which was the photograph uh, prior to this segment, and we're looking over Delacour Theater. Uh, where in the 1960s Joseph Papp produced Free Shakespeare in the Park. Um, Joseph Papp was originally named Joseph Paparovsky and was a communist organizer in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn. Um, <clears throat> he got into trouble with the House Un-American Activities Commission uh, and was forced out of CBS uh, where he was working. Um, because of the persecution uh, by that Senate committee. Um, basically, when the park was built, this was uh, where immigrants and Af African Americans used to live and they were forced out. Uh, there were also squatters here in the 1850s. Um, The Great Lawn um, has also been the uh, site of some very famous concerts like Elton John in 1980, Simon and Garfunkel in 81, and Diana Ross in 83. Uh, in 1982, one million people marched from the United Nations to the Great Lawn to support the United Nations Special Session on Nuclear Disarmament.